This is Valerie Cape at CMQCC. I want to welcome everyone to the call today. Um, I want to introduce our speakers. Elliot Main, MD, is a medical director at CMQCC and a clinical professor of OBGYN at Stanford University. David LeGrew is the executive medical director of Providence St. Joseph Health in Southern California. We have um, so much to cover today. I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to Elliot. Thank you, Valerie. If you could advance to the next slide, neither myself or the good-looking Dr. LeGru have any conflicts or disclosures to make today. Uh, the, this story is all about the cervix when all is said and done. Uh, it's also about parity. So those are going to be recurring themes, uh, recurring themes as we go through our presentation today. The ARRIVE trial has gotten a huge amount of attention, even though it's not published. Uh, and the second half of our, our discussion today will really be focused on what we know of the ARRIVE trial and how to put it into perspective. Next slide. Uh, some of the take-home messages that we really want to talk about today are the, the central importance of cervical ripeness, the discordancy of cesarean risk es estimates between observational studies and the more recent randomized controlled trials, extremely high hospital level variation in rates of cesarean after labor induction, which in turn implies that how you perform the induction is probably the most critical factor in play here. We are gonna discuss the new ACOG guidelines uh, and uh, an outpatient approach to cervical ripening. Next slide. But what we will not cover includes direct comparisons of products, uh, both medications such as misoprostol and prostaglandin inserts, as well as uh, mechanical tools such as uh, cervical balloons, either single or double uh, ballooned. Uh, we will not discuss the relative merits of AROM or membrane stripping or breast stimulation. Uh, and we'll also not go through uh, patient education, engagement, and expectations, all of which are important, but beyond our, our focus for today. Next slide. Oxytocin has been around a while. Uh, in 1906, it was one of the first uh, uh, polypeptides identified from the pituitary gland. And in 1953, it was the very first polypeptide to be sequenced and synthesized, earning a Nobel Prize. And within 10 years, it was starting to be, uh, to be used for initially supporting milk production uh, and then uh, for uh, the induction of labor in the 1960s. Next slide. The rate of induction uh, rose significantly in the 1990s. Uh, illustrated from this slide from the CDC, uh, you want to look at the dotted line in the middle, which is all gestational ages, uh, and then it's broken down with the other, other colored uh, lines to be the different gestational age subsets. Uh, so just, uh, all gestational age inductions rose from about 10% to 20%, uh, just simply in the time period from 1990 to 2004. Uh, interestingly, early term inductions uh, fell significantly from 2006 onwards. Uh, reflecting our efforts at, at limiting elective inductions prior to 39 weeks of gestation. Uh, obviously, post-term and late-term, i.e. Uh, 41 uh, to 42 weeks, have been uh, uh, or remain at very high levels, around 25 to 30 percent. So keep in mind that about 20 percent of all births are induced. Uh, all gestational ages, and currently, uh, that's around, excuse me, about 24% if you follow the red line back uh, to the y-axis. Next slide. We've been somewhat hobbled in our analysis of inductions by the, by the multiple definition criteria that have been used in the past. Uh, two years ago, ACOG came out with uh, some clarifications on the definitions of labor induction, uh, which are illustrated here as part of the revitalized uh, process. Uh, 
skipping to the bottom, induction of labor was defined as the use of pharmacological and mechanical methods to initiate labor. Uh, and it still applies even if the following are performed. Uh, unsuccessful attempts at initiating labor, i.e. center home, is still called the labor induction, or induction of labor following spontaneous rupture of membranes without contractions. Very important distinction here. Uh, and it should also be included that induction of labor, of course, includes cervical ripening. Uh, even if you don't have to use oxytocin later. Next slide. Uh, it was further clarified uh, that augmenta augmentation of labor only, uh, only occurs after the onset of spontaneous labor, defined as contractions with cervical change, or after spontaneous rupture of membranes if there are contractions. So, one of the, the difficult points uh, in, between different doctors' definitions of, of induction is in the setting of ruptured membranes, and this was meant to try and clear that up. Whereas if you had ruptured membranes with contractions, uh, and then you added oxytocin, that was an augmentation, which is the most common setting. But if you have absolutely no contractions and you have ruptured membranes, then that's a labor induction. Next slide. Key to our understanding of labor induction uh, success is the state of the cervix. Um, everyone knows about the Bishop score, which was developed in 1964, uh, has five different components. Obviously, everyone knows dilation and effacement, but also station consistency and position, and they're all given point values. Next slide. Uh, it should be noted that Dr. Bishop himself in 1964 made these observations about his score. And he had a lot of experience using this uh, in, in their clinic. Uh, in many settings, the elective inductions become frequent acceptable pro procedure justified by re reportedly satisfactory results. However, due to the unpredictability of nulliparous labor, even with a favorable cervix, uh, Dr. Bishop uh, the developer of the Bishop score felt that there was no justification for labor induction during a first pregnancy. And he then added in multiples, a score of nine or more will have a safe and successful labor. We would all agree with a nine or more uh, being a pretty good predictor of a successful vaginal birth in a multip. Uh, but obviously, folks wanted to expand its use to nullips and where to go from there. Next slide. Uh, this was followed up. Uh, a decade later uh, by Bird and colleagues uh, who modified it to make it applicable to more and to improve the uh, predictability. So they added, they applied it to nullips, but added a point for a nullip, or subtracted a point from the score for a nullip, and added one for each prior vaginal birth. Uh, and in, in their hands, they had failure rates uh, that were negligible uh, at 10 or more, i.e. above 9, like Bishop scored initially. Uh, and, but if you had a 0 to 4, it was a 50% C-section rate or failure rate. Uh, so again, this separated out folks that were really going to be problematic. Uh, and then we came into an age of cervical ripening with the recognition that the 0 to 4 Bishop score was not a very good predictor was not a very good uh, score to begin an induction and where to go from there. Next slide. Uh, this is well, well uh, supported now in the age of cervical ripening uh, with this data from Intermountain Healthcare uh, in the early 2000s. And here you can see the Bishop scores of zero, one, or two have uh, on average about a 40% C-section rate, even with cervical ripening. Three, four, and five are, are getting down uh, into the 20s. Uh, six and seven is in the teens. Uh, and they thought eight or nine was a uh, borderline yellow score. Uh, and they were most happy with 10 or more, which was a very low failure rate of eight, eight and five percent. Also in the next slide, you'll see the time to uh, spent on labor and delivery, which is a pretty good proxy for cost. 
as everyone knows, the cost of labor and delivery is largely reflected by the amount of staff time involved. We don't use that many expensive medicines or imaging services in labor. What we do use is a lot of nursing time. Uh, here you can see the, uh, the amount of uh, hours uh, with folks uh, it, with poor bishop scores being almost uh, 18 to 24 hours. Uh, and folks with, uh, with uh, mature or favorable bishop scores uh, being 7 to 10 hours. Uh, this really needs to be communicated well with our patients who often have the expectation they'll come in in the morning and have a baby, a baby by the afternoon. Uh, and that only really occurs in multiples uh, with a very favorable cervix, or if the providers dis decide to cut it short and perform a cesarean section at 5 p.m. But to get a vaginal delivery, you really have to be willing to spend a lot more time uh, with an induction, no matter how you do it. Next slide. So the actual rate of, of cesarean delivery uh, among women who, who are being induced is a very controversial subject. Uh, there have been a whole series of studies, uh, of uh, observational studies, uh, looking at what the difference in the cesarean rate between women who were induced and women who weren't. And they all come up with a odds ratio somewhere around two, by right? two-fold higher uh, C-section rate of women who were induced versus women who weren't. Uh, the last study uh, had additional data. These were all largely administrative data sets with very large numbers. The last study did have cervical ripening. And uh, this confirmed that if you have cervical ripening, your odds ratio is actually three and a half times higher than if you had uh, no induction of labor. Uh, these all have some faults in their study design, of course. Uh, next slide. Uh, induced versus non-induced can in introduce bias. Uh, if you know women who weren't initially induced uh, may, uh, may become induced later or have significant reasons for, for being induced, uh, and so folks have looked much more uh, 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 appropriately at a different study design, which is induced versus expected management, because you're uh, largely that's the choice at hand. You're not going to you're not going to choose a spontaneous labor necessarily. You're going to choose you're going to choose either induced at 39 weeks or. Uh, expected management, because there are some cervixes that just never ripen uh, during the course of an entire 42 weeks. However, expected management in most of the studies means uh, throughout the entire pregnancy, which could go up to 42, 43 weeks. Uh, and whereas most expected manage most uh, management protocols in our hospitals are now looking at induction at either 41 or 41 and a half, or, or at the very latest, 42 zero. So many of the analyses that show induced at 39 weeks versus expected management typically show no risk, increased risk of induction. Uh, you know, so the truth is somewhere in between. Uh, I think both methods have some uh, difficulties with how you interpret them uh, and are, don't really fit our, our best uh, approach. So let's go to the next slide and start looking at uh, the randomized controlled trials that have been done. Uh, induction has uh, uh, for post-AIDS pregnancies. Uh, in a nice review of Aaron Coey, uh, Annals Internal Medicine, this is part of a, uh, a contract to do a evidence-based medicine series. Uh, they actually had slightly fewer C-sections in women who were induced at, for post-dates, typically 40, uh, 41 or 42 weeks. And they clearly had fewer meconium-stained fluid uh, with a uh, 
relative risk of 1.7 for no meconium stained fluid. Uh, these studies were performed at academic centers, uh, so there was some concern about them, but most importantly, these were not stratified by parity. Uh, next slide is a similar type of study uh, done for an indication, not here, not, no, not now post-AIDS, but for preeclampsia in the Netherlands. Uh, the HIPATAT trial, very famous trial now, uh, which has changed our practice in the United States, uh, was a big randomized trial of 378 women in each arm, randomized uh, with the diagnosis of preeclampsia at 37 weeks, uh, randomized to induce or to expected management. Uh, and there was no difference in C-section rates in the uh, uh, in, in between the two arms. Uh, there was more morbidity noted uh, uh, in women with preeclampsia whose pregnancies were allowed to go on for two or three or four weeks further. However, no, notably, uh, the C-section rate was impressively low, 14 and 19 percent among the two groups. Uh, Think about the C-section rates for inductions in your hospital. We'll show you some of that data a little later in this talk. But 14 and 19 percent are very low rates for induced labor, unless they're almost all multiples. Also, you should remember, and this is a, a, uh, a random fact that's good for trivial pursuit, is that Dutch women are the tallest in the world. Uh, many are approaching six feet, and the average is well over five foot seven which makes for a bigger pelvis. Next slide. So uh, Vince Bergella uh, and, and his fellow did a very nice uh, uh, meta-analysis of, of several randomized uh, controlled trials of elective induction at 39, 41 weeks uh, and found a similar rate uh, of C-section 9.7 versus 7.5. Induced versus spontaneous, similar rates of choreo, 9.6 for induced versus 8.0. None of these were really big studies, though, so, uh, typically 100 or more. Next slide. Uh, there are only two of the randomized trials did some analysis of nullips. So you can see there were mostly multips fit in, and that's, again, one of our themes for the day. Uh, so there, in the sub-analysis of nullips in these five randomized trials, only 100 were in each arm. Uh, and there, there was a, quite a big difference between induced and spontaneous, uh, with a relative risk of 1.67 uh, uh, higher rates in induced women. So this is a little different. Uh, and obviously, we need bigger studies, more data here. Uh, next slide is the only other uh, randomized trial that's published on this, which is women over 35, uh, hoping to avoid uh, a perceived risk of stillbirth over 35. In the UK, uh, they have a, did a randomized trial of women largely 35 to 39, a little bigger study, 300 in each group, and, and did not find a difference in C-section rates. Those should be noted, their C-section rates were pretty high. 32, 33% uh, in each arm. And there was no difference in maternal or infant outcomes. So this actually made it new to the New England Journal of Medicine. So uh, now we're gonna turn briefly to the ARRIVE trial just to put it in, in the perspective with these others. Next slide. Uh, the ARRIVE trial was done all in university hospitals, all with strong induction of labor guidelines and all with formal standards for failed induction. They had to have 15 hours of ruptured membranes with oxytocin, and it was a very low risk population. Overall, they, sh they showed that uh, in this presentation that the C-section rate in this population in these hospitals was actually slightly lower in the induced population. More details to come later, and we uh, I'll really go into the details. Next slide. So what can we do uh, as practicing physicians uh, and nurse leaders when, we're, when we have a lot of conflicting data? Uh, we have 
data from retrospective studies, we have data from smaller RCTs, and now with a bigger RCT. How can you pick from the literature? And classically, this is what you do with any article in the literature. You have to say, is my study and patient population the same as those in the studies I'm looking for? Does my hospital have strict induction protocols like the ones they've used in the randomized controlled trials? Does my hospital have a strict guideline for what a failed induction is, like what was used in some of the randomized trials? And uh, am I getting similar results? In, you know, one of the take home messages here is that an induction of labor is not as simple as giving a medication for pneumonia. Uh, it involves a whole process of care, not just the administration of oxytocin. It involves a lot of judgments. It involves a lot of decision makings all the way along the way. Um, then we're going to talk a bit about where ACOG guidelines are. Guidelines are. Next slide. So I'd like to pause for a moment and look at at the just what C-section rates are with labor inductions in typical hospitals, average hospitals, non-university hospitals, that what we see in California. Next slide. This is simply the cesarean rate after labor induction in NELIPS in every hospital in California, 244 hospitals. Uh, and the C-section rates range from 16% uh, to 100%. Obviously, we have a bit of outliers at each end, but it certainly ranged from 20 to 80 percent uh, when, you, when you look at the, uh, the middle uh, quartiles. Striking variation. Next slide, you see the rates at the very end are those that were, were reported in the protocol-driven randomized controlled trial, i.e., in the teens, they're low 20s. Uh, obviously, what's going on in most hospitals in California is very different. So that's where we need to spend a lot of time now. So let's, next slide, we're going to start looking at what ACOG has presented about this. And one of the seminal articles has been the guidelines for defining labor abnormalities and management options, a combined SMFM ACOG uh, bulletin from just a couple of years ago. Next slide. Uh, what they weighed in an induction of labor is that a, a uh, that before 41 weeks induction should generally be performed based on maternal and fetal medical indications. Uh, inductions at 41 and, uh, and beyond should be performed to reduce the risk. Cervical ripening should be used uh, with an unfavorable cervix. These are all strong recommendations. And if maternal and fetal status allow, cesarean delivery for failed induction should only occur after uh, uh, at least 12 to 18 hours of membrane, membrane rupture, including oxytocin time. So next slide. Uh, these are all strong recommendations uh, based on what they considered high quality evidence. Next slide. So the average labor curves uh, are shown here, uh, and the orange and green ones are the typical spontaneous labor curves that we see with a pretty strong inflection occurring between four and six centimeters. Uh, what you see in induced labor, however, is a much protracted latent phase uh, with the red and blue lines, either nullips or multips. Uh, that it took an awfully long time to get from zero to four to five centimeters, uh, indicating that we really have to have very different standards uh, for evaluating labor during induction than we do in spontaneous labor. Uh, next slide. The big difference is clearly in latent phase. Uh, here you see that the active phase isn't much different, but where the difference is really is, is before six centimeters. So again, underscoring the need for patience uh, and not rushing to decisions until you're truly in the active phase of labor, six centimeters and hopefully 100% of phase. Uh, next slide, ACOG also made uh, 
uh, contributions to the Choose Lee Wisely campaign, uh, a national effort to identify, uh, consider things that one shouldn't do uh, that are commonly uh, out there either on request or, or in, in uh, common use practice. Uh, next slide. Uh, number two here was to don't schedule elective non-medically indicated inductions of labor between 39 and 41 weeks unless the cervix is deemed favorable. Uh, Subcontext, ideally labor should start in its own whenever possible, et cetera. Uh, so we have warnings from several sites here, uh, from ACOG, from SMFM, et cetera. Uh, so next slide. How do we look at induct elective inductions of 39 to 41 weeks? First, of course, do no harm. Uh, are the risks minimal? That depends. What is your rate? Uh, what's in your wallet, so to speak? Uh, if you have a C-section rate of induced labor that's 15%, uh, it's probably not much additional harm. It may be a much longer labor for the woman if you haven't uh, not given her the opportunity to go into labor. Uh, I think the second caveat is that a first first birth and the need for cervical ripening should be treated very carefully. That's uh, asking for trouble. Uh, a number of hospitals have have uh, uh, and whole health systems have uh, indicated that elective inductions uh, before 41 weeks should be limited to favorable bishop scores, at least six and more likely eight. Or others have suggested that if you have to do cervical ripening, you shouldn't be doing elective induction. Uh, we know, though, that a, a long hard cervix of 40 weeks has no easy choices. Uh, it may not ripen further. Uh, but I think before 40, 41 weeks, you should be giving her the benefit of the doubt. In any setting, though, a, an induced labor has a very different shaped labor curve in longer, particularly latent phase labor. That has to be remembered as you manage these. So, you know, keys for induction success is being picky who you choose. Uh, particularly focusing on cervical ripeness and parity, uh, being very careful how you perform the induction. An induction is not an induction is not an induction. How you do it matters. And follow your own success rates. The data center will give you, the, in California, the maternal data center will provide you your cesarean rates uh, for induced women by parity, nullips or multips, uh, and that can be very helpful for self-assessment. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to, to Dr. LeGru, uh, who's going to go into more detail on a RIVE trial and on outpatient uh, cervical ripening. David. Thank you, Elliot. And uh, I'm going to jump in and give a little bit more detail on the ARRIVE trial because it has uh, generated a lot of discussion, even though it's just been presented as an abstract and the, the paper is still pending, as, as we'll talk about. Um, the ARRIVE trial was presented uh, in February at the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine annual meeting and was a randomized control trial comparing patients randomized to either 39 weeks uh, labor induction or expectant management to, to up to 42 and two sevenths weeks. The primary outcome was actually a composite of perinatal outcomes. In other words, how, how did the baby do? And a secondary outcome was uh, the rate of cesarean birth. The trial included 3,000 low risk women in each arm and was performed by the uh, maternal fetal uh, medicine uh, network and, and was a very well, as Elliot mentioned, a very well done trial. Uh, so it got a lot of attention. Next slide. Here were the, the, the main results. First of all, um, there was a difference as one would expect in gestational age at delivery between the two. 39.3 um, weeks in the induced group and 40 weeks in the expected management uh, group. 
So uh, I think the surprising part of that is it really was only a, a few days, uh, which also explains, by the way, while, while even a trial this big could not uh, be expected to demonstrate a difference in the stillbirth rate. Uh, Preeclampsia and gestational hypertension occurred in 9% of the uh, uh, folks induced uh, in the 39-week group and 14% in the expectant management group. Uh, in uh, the newborns, 3% of the induced patients needed respiratory support versus 4% in the expectant management. The primary uh, perinatal outcome uh, was slightly greater at, at, in the expected management group, 5.4% compared to 4%, but this was not statistically uh, different, even though, as, as was stated, it's a pretty large group. Uh, what was different was the rate of cesarean delivery, uh, and a statistical difference, 18.6% uh, uh, in the Induced, electively induced group and 22.2% in the expected management group. Next slide. Now, obviously, this made immediate news, and, and I'm sure many of you heard it at your own hospital and, and had discussions. And of course, the way it came across in the press was it was uh, basically you can lower C section rates by inducing labor at 39 weeks. And so it did get a lot of excitement and uh, feedback. But as I said, this was just an abstract, so we don't have a lot of the details. Next slide. Um, there were some interesting findings in the abstract. Uh, uh, perinatal complications such as neonatal seizures or in the mother third or fourth degrees were higher in the induced group, which seems uh, a little unusual. Uh, the incidence of preeclampsia uh, rose from 9.1% to 14.3, even though there was only on average five days more of gestational length, which, which again is, is a bit surprising. And uh, as I think Elliot mentioned in his discussion, the NTSV C-section rates were lower than the vast majority of, of U.S. hospitals in both groups, 18.6 and 22.2 are both much lower, uh, and I would refer back to the curve that uh, Dr. Main displayed uh, earlier. Uh, importantly, the time to delivery was not given, and therefore it's hard to assess in the abstract what would be the impact of, of doing more elective inductions on uh, labor and delivery. So these are all uh, questions. Next. Slide. Interestingly enough, too, in the same issue, there was the uh, same group published uh, a, a study where they looked at the guidelines for failed induction. And in that uh, publication, the C section rate, presumably in the same group of hospitals uh, for uh, no lips, was 33% in, in, in induction. So Again, it kind of gets back, this all feeds back to a lot of what Dr. Main was describing in that it's how you pick the patients and, and how you do the inductions that may be critical here. Next, next slide. So we do have to wait for the paper before we make any final recommendations or analysis, uh, but, but here's the types of things we'll be looking for. What were the protocols for induction and labor management? In other words, how did they actually uh, conduct them to get these good numbers in both groups? Um, what was the impact on the length of labor? And could the average hospital, could you obtain these results in, the, in, the, in your institution and would uh, elect them to in, uh, freely, uh, a pattern of freely electively induce, uh, overwhelm uh, the capacity of most labor and deliveries? Um, why were certain complications so uh, uh, high? Pre the rates of preeclampsia and chorioamnionitis were actually much higher than uh, most studies. So again, we'll delve into that when we see the paper. And lastly, um, to, just to, to, it would be interesting 
in the study, if you compare the subgroups in both of those, if you compared spontaneous labor to induced labor, what were the various C-section rates so we could, could compare? Next slide. Now, I wanted to kind of put into perspective and kind of expand a little bit of, about what Dr. Main talked about, about the difference between comparing spontaneous labor and induction and comparing uh, induction versus expected management. And I want to uh, give a shout out. There's a website called howardisms.com run by Dr. Howard Harrell back in Tennessee who really uh, nicely summarizes this, and you may want to hit that uh, uh, site. But anyway, this is a list of all the retrospective spontaneous labor versus inductions uh, listed here. And again, I'll, I won't go through the detail because I know that's one of those oh my gosh slides. But look if you plot these out. Next slide, please. And what you do is you compare what was the C-section rate in the induction group versus the spontaneous labor. And if you draw a line up the middle, that would be if they were equal. If, if the study fell below the line, that really favors allowing spontaneous labor. And if it goes above it, that would favor induction. And as you can see, all the induced, um, uh, uh, all, the, all the data that's in this data favors spontaneous labor. Next slide. So now let's do a similar thing for looking at data from the elective induction trials. And uh, the ones that uh, were mentioned earlier on here, as well as some of the ones that go back to the 1970s, and I've added on there the uh, Dr. Groveman et al., the ARRIVE trial, on there so we can kind of peek and see how that comes out playing this same sort of comparison. Next slide, please. Now what you see, and by, by the way, the size of the, the dot is the number of patients. And you can see, first of all, the ARRIVE trial, which is the big orange dot in the middle, is, is, it, you know, is much, much larger than any of the prior trials. But prior to the ARRIVE trials, you had uh, studies that favored expected management and you had studies that favored uh, inductions. And the other uh, point to be made, if you notice, there's a lot of, a lot of these trials that were done in the 70s had very low C-section rates and they're the ones sort of clustered uh, at, the, at the bottom. These were all nulliferous, uh, you know, C-section rates, et cetera, and in comparison. Next slide, please. So if you try to analyze all this and, and, and rectify how we can compare this uh, seemingly perplexing uh, problem of, wait a second, in spontaneous labor, we have a low C-section rate. Why have we induced people electively? Do we get a lower C-section rate? Here's the possibilities. First of all, does C-section rate increase with gestational age? There's some data on that that has been published, and I would tell you in our, our data as well, when we've analyzed it internally, uh, but it really doesn't jump up until about uh, 41 weeks. But it plausibly makes sense in the, in the sense there are factors like uh, some infants do get larger and, and therefore uh, raise the C-section risk. And of course, uh, placental insufficiency can uh, develop, and so there's less placental reserve. So there are, is some uh, possible uh, 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 factors there that could explain it. Um, the other thing is, as was shown in the ARRIVE trial, there's a higher rate of indicated inductions uh, when you use expected management. So for example, the, the number of folks with preeclampsia uh, increase, and what that means is that you're not allowed to have further expected management and it sort of forces you to get the patient delivered in a set amount of time with perhaps an unripe cervix and of course that could lead to increased c-section rates again as we analyze the arrived trial data when it comes out we, we may be able to answer which of these factors uh, in that study uh, potentially had that next slide 
Now there's another study that you may want to look, look at, or another abstract, I should say, from the Society of Maternal Fetal Medicine by Pinelli and all uh, that's uh, shown here. And it's a very interesting study because what they did was break down their cervical exams and ask the question, if the cervix is greater than a centimeter, less than a centimeter, or equal to a centimeter, what's the chances within a week that the patient will go into spontaneous labor on their own? Because some people who have advocated elective inductions have said, well, gosh, let's just induce the folks with the right cervix. Well, what these authors found was very interesting. If, if your cervical exam was greater than a centimeter, again, they did it in uh, dilation, not in Bishop scores, but if it was greater than one centimeter, suggesting a better Bishop score, if you did that at 39 weeks, you had about a 60% chance that within the week, uh, patients would come in in spontaneous labor. And in fact, if you had the same data greater than a centimeter and she was 40 weeks, then you had an 81% chance that within a week they were going to come in in spontaneous labor. So again, judging or choosing to electively induce people who have ripe cervixes may be a self-fulfilling prophecy because it's, those are simply the group that were going to come in and deliver on their own as well. So again, there's just stuff we need to, to, to learn about this. Next slide. Uh, we did put out a position. Uh, 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 CMQCC did take a position after the trial came out, after the ARRIVE trial came out in an effort to sort of look at that and say, gosh, um, you know, what, what should we do? And many of the arguments that I've just discussed uh, are in that. So you may want to go on to our website, uh, cmqcc.org, peek at that and uh, read that. Next slide. So in summary, um, I, I think making recommendations right now into clinical practice, really we need to wait for the full uh, publication. We really need to look at the population they, they studied and see how generalizable is that. In other words, do those patients match your patient? And, and most importantly as well, we need to look at the cost and resource uh, questions. Those need to be addressed because again, if we do uh, do protracted long labors, uh, we will be uh, overburdening potentially uh, our folks. Having said all that, uh, it does beg the question of if we did know uh, uh, some of these, could we perhaps pick a population of patients that would be beneficial and lower their C-section rate by elective induction at 39 weeks? So I want to leave it at that and change subjects a little bit. Next slide, please. Um, we've gotten through the C-section collaboratives a lot of uh, interest in one of the techniques for uh, lowering the burden to your labor and deliveries and, and hopefully uh, helping with, with uh, better ripening uh, techniques. And so I want to talk a little bit about uh, outpatient balloon uh, cervical ripening. Next slide. Now, uh, again, as, as Dr. Main said in the introduction, we're not going to get in a huge deep discussion of different techniques and, and how they work. Um, because that's a lecture in itself. But there is good evidence in the literature, as is noted in this Cochrane review from back in 2012, that basically mechanical methods uh, and uh, uh, prostaglandins or, or uh, medications essentially have the same effect on the cervix as far as ripening goes. Um, uh, and so the, 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 the only major difference is that with balloons and things of that nature, there, there does not appear to be the, the risk of um, tachycystole or hyperstimulation of the, of the uterus, and therefore monitoring is, is not necessary uh, during the actual process. Next slide. Now, uh, next slide, please. So the rationale for doing outpatient balloons is the following. First of all, as I said, mechanical methods are as effective. 
Uh, and and uh, number two, it can be done outpatient because we're not uh, at risk for tachysystole. There's multiple studies to say that has not occurred. Um, and um, there's also evidence that shows that patients are more comfortable with this. There's less cramping. Uh, obviously, they don't have to spend the night in the hospital. And therefore, there's less cost since the monitoring and nursing care are not used for the 8 to 12 hours. In fact, on average, it, it's about um, um, uh, 9 hours. And so it seems like a pretty good thing. Next slide. There has been some um, uh, studies of this. Dr. Shoshone and, and group uh, back in New Jersey have uh, done this randomized control trial as well as they have a retrospective analysis of utilizing the balloon in some 2,000 patients. And it does indeed seem to be a very uh, uh, safe uh, method that seems to be effective. So there is some evidence-based literature to back up this uh, particular uh, technique. S next slide. The other thing is, if you ask the question, well, how, how will this unburden my, my labor and delivery? How will this, um, I, I took this, this study by Levine et al. in the Green Journal back in 16, was a randomized trial where they compared mesoprostol, uh, mesoprostol with cervical foley uh, and uh, cervical foley with oxytocin. And they compared all these different methodologies as far as admission to time of delivery. And you can see the original study concluded that mesoprostol, the red line uh, with cervical foley was actually the quickest way to get everybody uh, delivered. But what I did was take their data and then move the green line, the cervical foley only line and move that down into uh, supposing you had done this as an outpatient. And you can see how much time uh, you shave off uh, by doing that. So for example, as we'll talk about in our technique, if you see them at four or five in the office uh, the day before and put it in, you're really shaving off about 10 to 12 hours of time that would have been in a latent phase. So again, in noliferous patients, and that's what's shown here, that's a significant amount of time. Next slide. Um, I do have a good deal of experience with doing this. Um, basically, uh, our technique involved having the patient actually come to L&D and, and a navigator reviewed the documents, uh, made sure the prenatal labs and orders were in place, explained uh, the induction uh, procedure, and, and then uh, made sure a pre-induction checklist was, was done on the patient. Patient then went over to the office and had the uh, cervical balloon placed, uh, and then the patient came back at, at uh, six the next morning, and uh, the induction was started so that by uh, 8 a.m. Uh, things were uh, rolling along. Next slide. Here's a, a description, a, a drawing of, of how the technique is. Um, it's actually uh, quite, uh, uh, quite straightforward and, and not particularly difficult. When we were doing it, uh, 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 unlike some of the descriptions in the literature, we actually uh, tie off the catheter, cut it free, and then put it in the vagina. We do not strap it to the uh, or tape it to the leg, et cetera, and put it on traction. Uh, set. And, and actually there's data in the literature to suggest that might, uh, this, by not putting it to traction, you might get a bit more dilation anyway. But uh, anyway, this was our technique and I'm not gonna go into too much detail since time doesn't permit. Next, next slide. So I think if we put all this uh, together, we would still recommend at present following ACOG guidelines uh, and avoiding uh, elective inductions until we know a bit more about the details of the ARRIVE trial and which population, which group of patients this might uh, work well with. Um, I do think, and I'll echo what uh, Dr. Main said about it's critical that you follow not only your hospital's induction rate, but the individual provider success rates for inductions, 
obviously if you can get it below into the teens and 20s that seems to be best practice as, as shown by the, the data. Uh, and again, uh, how you do the induction and uh, you know what tools you use uh, are important. And uh, my bias is to is to move towards getting more of the outpatient uh, uh, cervical ripening patients, uh, with the only exception being, of course, patients with conditions where you do need to monitor the mother or the baby, such as ruptured membranes blood pressure problems, et cetera. So next slide with that, I will uh, pause and I think we're gonna open up to questions. Thank you. Yes, thank you, David and Elliot. Um, I'm gonna double check the questions. For those of you who are on, still on the call, um, you can type your questions into the chat box and we will address them as they come in. The first question is, what percentage um, of NOLIPS are induced? And you may have covered that, but just to go over, make sure we cover that again. It, it varies greatly from hospital to hospital, but it's somewhere around 20%. Okay, so 20%. The next question is, which instance is it evidence-based to have an elective induction? You want to go with that, David? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it gets back to the discussion, the ARRIVE trial, and, and again, I I don't think I could today tell you precisely who that who that makes sense in, uh, you know, based upon just the abstract. But again, if there are certain populations and certain uh, providers and hospitals that are very good at inductions. Uh, it, it, it may be that we can identify a subgroup that that's in, but I, I would be hesitant to tell you precisely who that group would be. So I don't, uh, Dr. Main, feel free to, to share your comments on that. I think we've, and the question is, what population is it appropriate for elective inductions or, or uh, indicated inductions? I think the question was elected. Yes, it was elective. Okay. <clears throat> well, it's sort of interesting. Uh, Ten years ago, the, the guidelines were 42 weeks. We've largely moved that down in many centers to 41 weeks. Uh, and that's now become, quote, a, an elective indicated induction. Uh, that, that has uh, been associated with much lower rates of uh, meconium uh, aspiration uh, than before, and I think that's been a, an appropriate move. Uh, I think if you're talking at this point, the, the population that I would look to with those who had a very favorable cervix and were multips, uh, I, I think inducing nullips you have to be really, really careful about. And uh, again, you have to have, you have to be willing to to be there for the long haul because it's a, a roll of the dice. You don't know how quickly or easily any woman that you start to induce is actually going to respond and go into labor. It could be four to six hours or it could be 24 or 36 hours. And both you and the woman have to be, be ready to and accepting of that. So there's a lot more attention needs to be paid for patient education and preparation before an induction of labor. Um, the next question is, what is your data source for the NTSV um, C-sections in each hospital? So we use a combination of vital records, uh, which in California we get from our, our Department of Public Health every month. So that gives us a good sense of parity and a good sense of gestational age. Uh, and we also use, we will link that to the hospital discharge diagnosis files, uh, which in combination with our records gives us cesarean birth uh, and position in twins. And those are the only four things you need to have accurately to do an NTSV C-section rate. Uh, so in California, we have the Maternal Data Center, which is also available in most hospitals in Washington and Oregon. Uh, and so those are all uh, provided and benchmarked and compared for all the hospitals in those three states. 
There are um, a couple people who have raised their hand. If you have a question, can you please type it into the chat box? That would be helpful for us, and then we can address it. Um, the next question is, are outpatient cervical ripening balloons offered to plus GBS patients? And do those patients with cervical ripening balloons require prophylaxis? Yeah, um, yes, they are. We, we know, of course, that about somewhere between 25 and 33% of patients are carriers um, of group B strep. And uh, we didn't, we certainly in our practice, and I would say in the literature, no one has uh, not or is, has excluded uh, such patients. And we would just uh, give them prophylaxis uh, in labor. Uh, just just as they were, uh, uh, you know, as if they hadn't had it. So so we did not typically start uh, any antibiotics until they arrived in labor and delivery. And kind of the add-on comment and question, um, uh, um, is a concern about that you have a, a mechanical opening rather than ripening, and that kind of a, that's a, kind of a reluctance to use the foley. And then um, um, when you place the Foley, do you put the balloon above the internal OS or try to inflate it within the cervical canal? Yeah, those are two questions. The second I'll answer first, um, no, you try to put the balloon, in fact, that's what the diagram shows. You do a digital exam before you insert and you estimate the length of the cervix so that if it's three centimeters long, then you mark the catheter uh, with the purple, the purple marker uh, three centimeters above the top of the balloon. So as you're inserting uh, and, the, and the purple marker reaches the external os, that presumably is very close to the balloon being at the level of the uh, upper os. And, I, and I'm sorry, I, I extended my answer and forgot that the first was, I think, concern over, hey, this might open the cervix but not ripen it. Uh, and, and the only thing I can tell you again in, in uh, the trials and in the literature, uh, what the evidence would suggest is that this does work as well as mesoprostol or cervidil uh, and or the other methods. And so therefore, uh, uh, I think it's a reasonable alternative. So uh, I think that I th let me add to that. I think the the questioner has uh, is onto something. There is literature suggesting that there is more dilation than effacement with balloons. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you're a patient, it, it, uh, that difference does not matter. But just be expected that you may end up with a balloon two or three or four centimeters dilated, but still only 50% of face, and be prepared to go with it after that. So there's a couple more questions that are related to each other. Um, do you recommend a consent for an output, outpatient Foley balloon procedure? And um, what's the standard or necessary documentation for the patient? And typically, when is this done? So um, we, we didn't have a specific uh, consent form for the cervical ripening and and but we do obviously have one when they get to, to labor and delivery for the induction um, we did uh, and it's on I think we've uploaded it to, to the to the cmqcc.org website uh, the the patient information sheet along with uh, the techniques and 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 some slides if you need those are, are all up there as part of the C-section collaborative. Um, so you might want to look there and see for that information. And um, would you send a patient with a single prior LTSC home with a Foley if she lives close to the hospital? Uh, yes, we, we actually did. And in fact, it's interesting, many centers, if you talk to different folks, that's been their, their biggest use of cerv a cervical ripening with, with the balloon is in in uh, prior uh, C-section patients because it has there are studies to show it's safe and of course because it doesn't cause contractions there's no thought that it would uh, cause uh, any any problems but and and we uh, 
certainly in our experience uh, uh, did that as well. But I, I don't know, Elliot, do you want to comment on that? No, I think it, you're fine. And then the last question, uh, do you need to monitor the patient before or after insertion of the balloon as an outpatient? So I, I think that's the most interesting one. I will tell you the answer is in New Jersey, yes, because Dr. Shison and, and his colleagues uh, in their retrospective review found two patients out of 2,000 uh, that uh, actually had a fetal heart rate tracing uh, before the balloon that, that uh, made him go ahead and, and intervene for the patient. If you talk to him, he, he cannot tell you if this was high risk patients or why they were having the induction. So it's not clear that the, the uh, reason, but I, we, did, we never did at Saddleback and, and knock on wood have not had a bad outcome. I think the way to look at this, um, again, it's not causing any contraction, so it shouldn't be causing the baby any problems. And if you worry about, well, gosh, what about if there's a stillbirth before the next morning? Well, the incidence of stillbirth in, in the range we're talking about it is about 0.6 per thousand. And, since, and that's per week. So we're talking about a 12-hour period. You're probably talking, uh, you'd have to do about 25,000 of these to, to see a stillbirth by the next morning. And that's in a population where you haven't asked the mom, is the baby moving and kicking? And presumably they're low risk enough to do this as an outpatient. So I personally, I do not think it's necessary, but again, I, I, uh, if you wanna be conservative and get an NST before that, that's reasonable. We are at time and I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Thank David and Elliot for their presentations today. There's a couple of the questions that I have been asked and I will um, capture those and send them on to the appropriate physician and make sure we get an answer back to you. If you're looking at for any of the references that have been um, uh, mentioned today, the slides will be available on the CMQCC website uh, later today or tomorrow and the recording will be available of the webinar today on the CMQCC um, YouTube channel. If there are any other resources, anything that were referenced today that you're not quite sure how to access, please feel free to email me at CMQCC. This is Valerie Cape, and my email is vcape at stanford.edu, and I'll be happy to direct you. Thank you everyone for joining us today, and thank you David and Elliot for your presentation. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.